Welcome to part two of session two. In uh, this segment, we're going to look at the knowledge of good and evil. What is this thing? This is the thing that Adam and Eve, they violated. They ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And this is a really bad thing that brought death. And they got kicked out of this paradise garden and things got really bad. What was this? And because it's it's hard to tell from just what you read. And so the first thing and probably most important thing to know about what, what is the God, knowledge of good and evil is that that phrase is an idiom. And if you're not familiar with an idiom, let me, let me explain. This is from dictionary.com. An idiom is an expression whose meaning is not predictable from the usual meanings of its parts, right? It, the constituent elements. So here's a couple of examples that dictionary.com gives. Kick the bucket and hang one's head. So if you take the phrase, kick the bucket, which means to die, um, kick, kick and bucket, what in the world does that have to do with dying, right? It did, doesn't really seem to have anything to do with dying. And, and so you can't read those words and know that they, they mean to die. And um, really kind of all of language works this way. Vocabulary works this way. If you don't know the meaning of the word, but you do know the meaning of the constituent parts of the word, it doesn't mean that you really can figure out the meaning. So let me give you an example of that. The word indifferent. If you didn't know what the word indifferent meant, um, and you had no context to try and figure that out, you just heard this word, you don't know what it means, and you were to think, okay, well, let me think about the constituent parts, in and different. Okay, well, in can mean like in something, inside something, and different means different. It means something that's that's not the same as, as something else. Okay, so in the different thing, in, in something that's different. Maybe that's what it means, is that a person who's in something that's different. Or it could be that in sometimes as a prefix is, is a negative. It, it's like un, right? So uh, incapable, for, men, for instance, means uh, not capable. So maybe indifferent means not different. Ah, yeah, that's probably what it means, right? That's, that's what it means. It means not different. And of course, we know that's not at all what the word different means, you know? And, and you, can't actually, um, you, you can't actually know what that word means without just knowing what the word means. And so idiom, idiomatic expressions they all, almost always work this way, where you don't know the meaning of the word. So here's the thing. The knowledge of good and evil, it's an idiom, and it does not mean to have knowledge of good and evil or right and wrong. It doesn't mean that. It means something different than that. Like every idiom, it has a meaning attributed to the phrase that isn't what the words of the phrase mean. So we need to gain an understanding of the idiom before we can understand how it's being used in, in any particular context, just like kick the bucket, you know, you know, well, I'm, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty, it's been pretty hard around here because Jacob kicked the bucket. Well, okay. It sounds like Jacob got really mad. Maybe it's hard around here because Jacob is really mad and he's been unpleasant to deal with. You've got to know what the idiom means. And then you can know, oh, I'm really sorry. I, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that about Jacob, right? So, so this is true in this context of Genesis 2 and 3. We have to know the meaning of the idiom, the knowledge of good and evil, before we can have any idea of what's really happening in this record. So what I want to do is I want to take you through a number of scriptures where we're going to learn this idiom. Because it is possible, if you get enough usages of an idiom, to start to learn what the idiom means. Unfortunately, we've got enough 
evidence in, in the Bible to know how they were using this phrase. So the first part is I want to look at the phrase good and evil itself. And what we're going to see is that that phrase is connected to the concept of judgment um, or uh, dis discernment, uh, that, that sort of thing. Let's begin in 1 Kings chapter 3. This is verses 6 through 9. Then Solomon said, you have shown great faithfulness to your servant David, my father, according as he walked before you in truth, righteousness, and uprightness of heart toward you. And you have reserved for him, and I should say this is so Solomon is, he's becoming king and uh, he's praying to God because there's, he's got a problem um, and God is wanting to know what he, what he wants help with. What does he want him to do for him as king? You have reserved for him this great faithfulness that you have given him a, a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Verse seven. And now, Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father, David. Yet I am like a little boy. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people who are too many to be numbered or counted. So give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, to discern between good and evil. For who is capable of judging this great people of yours? So we see that this phrase, good and evil, in this case, discern between good and evil, is, is being used in the sense of the judge. He needs to have good judgment in order to be able to judge the people. He wants to be capable of judging rightly, so he needs to be able to discern between good and evil. In 1 Kings 3.28, a, a few verses later, it says, when all Israel heard about the judgment which the king handed down, they feared the king because they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to administer justice. That was the thing he was praying for when he was praying for to be able to discern between good and evil. And in the story in between these two sections is the story of where these two women have these babies and in the night, one of the babies dies and one of the women switches out the baby, the, the baby with the dead, or the, the mom with the bed, dead baby switches the two babies out and pretends the other baby's hers. And, uh, the other woman, you know, sees what's going on. She knows that this other baby's hers. They bring this uh, to court to Solomon to to um, uh, to fix this problem, and and so Solomon does the thing where he says, you yeah, know, well, you know, bring a sword, cut the baby in half, and give each of them half of it. And the true mother, you know. You know, freaks out at that and says, no, 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 no. Give it, give it the baby to her. Don't kill the baby. Give the baby to her. And the false mother says, yes, do it. Right. So Solomon knows that he knows now, which, which is the mother he can tell by their reactions, who the real mother is. And so the people saw this and they were like, wow, the wisdom of God is in him to administer justice. And that, that thing that they saw, that's what he was praying for. And that was to discern between good and evil. Let's look at another example. In 2 Samuel chapter 14, verse 17, it says, Then your servant said, Please let the word of my Lord the king be comforting. For as the angel of God, so is my Lord the king to discern good and evil. And may the Lord your God be with you. So what's going on here is um, Absalom has fled from, from David. Um, he, you know, he killed his brother. David's mad. And it's been a while. And uh, Joab wants to bring Absalom back. And he convinces this wise woman, this prophetess, to go to David and kind of do this ruse sort of thing um, in order to get him to see that he needs to let Absalom you know, come back. And so when she is talking to him, She's, she's asking a question and, and she's, she's going to ask a question and she wants a good, uh, a, a wise judgment from the king about this, right? She's, she's sort of playing up, hey, you're, you're wise, you're able to judge properly. 
And I'm looking for you to do that. So this is why she says, please let the word of my Lord, the King be comforting for as the angel of God. So is my Lord, the King to discern good and evil. It's again, this is judgment that he's going to, to render. In Jeremiah chapter 42, one through six, we see a slightly different, we're going to see it's still judgment, but it's a little bit sort of different kind of thing going on. We'll see, but it still involves this idea of judgment. Verse one, then all of the commanders of the forces, I should, I should back up a little bit. So Babylon has conquered, um, you know, the territories of Israel and now Judah. And, you know, it's been pretty bad and that sort of thing. And um, the, the, the leaders of, of Judah that are left over, what they want to do is they want to run away. Um, they want to go someplace where the king of Babylon can't get them. And they're thinking, you know, Egypt is the place to go to. So that's where we pick this up. They're going to come to Jeremiah and they, they're going to ask him to uh, go ask God about this. Then all the commanders of the forces, Johanan, the son of Korea, uh, Jezaniah, the son of Hashaya, and all the people from the small to the great approached and said to Jeremiah the prophet, Please let our pleading come before you and pray for us to the Lord your God for all this remnant, since we have been left only a few out of many, just as your own eyes now, uh, now see us, that the Lord your God will tell us the way in which we should walk and the thing that we should do. So they're asking for a, a, a judgment in terms of, should we, 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 we want to go, where do we need to go? You know, are will you bless? You know, we want to go to Egypt, but is God blessing that? Then Jeremiah the prophet said to them, I have heard you. Behold, I'm going to pray to the Lord your God in accordance with your words, and I will tell you the whole message with the which the Lord gives you as an answer. I will not withhold a word from you. So now, one of the things you need to know is that Jeremiah knows these guys really well at this point, and he knows that what they really want is they just want approval of what they want to do, right? They want to go to Egypt. They want to get away from Babylon. They, they feel like they can go down to Egypt and be safe there. And, um, and that's really what they want to hear. And Jeremiah knows kind of what they're up to. And, and But he's telling them, okay, I'll do what you've asked me to do, but I'm only going to say what God says to me, and I'm going to give you that whole message. I won't hold anything back. Verse five, then they said to Jeremiah, may the Lord be a true and faithful witness against us if we do not act in accordance with the whole message with which the Lord your God will send you to us, whether it is pleasant or unpleasant. And the underlying words there are the same words we've seen before, good and evil. Whether it is good or evil, we will listen to the voice of the Lord our God to whom we are sending you. Now, here's the thing, and we're going we're to see this strongly in uh, the next record, that this, you know, when, when you see this to discern good and evil, it, it's sort of this right and wrong, sort of what's the right thing, what's the wrong thing? They're not, they're not really asking, it, you know, if the thing you tell us is good and we like it, we'll listen, or if the thing that you tell us is bad, you know, we'll listen this phrase is being used to say, whatever you come back with, we're going to listen to that and we're going to do it to the voice of the Lord, our God, to whom we are sending you so that it may go well for us when we listen to the voice of the Lord, our God. That's really kind of, of the intent. And of course, Jeremiah comes back with, don't go to Egypt, stay and the Lord will take care of you and he will protect you. And they get mad and they go to Egypt anyway, right? Because again, it was what they wanted to do. Let's look at the, another record. Here is Genesis chapter 31. This is verses 22 through 42. So let me give you a little bit of a uh, background here. So Jacob, uh, the son of Isaac, who, uh, the grandson of Abraham, has gone off. He's fled from his family because his, you know, he's afraid his brother's going to kill him. And he, he comes to his uncle's um, his mother's brother's um, uh, uh, country, and and he falls in love with one of his brother Laban's daughters, Rachel. 
Uh, and Laban does a deal. Well, you work for me for seven years and I'll give you my daughter. And so then he, he does. And then Laban tricks him and gives him Leah instead, uh, his older daughter. Uh, but Jacob doesn't know that it's Leah when they consummate the, the marriage. And, and then he finds out afterwards. And so now he, he's married to Leah. He's really mad. Laban says, well, listen, work for me for seven more years. I'll go ahead and give you Rachel. And so he works for him for seven more years. He's got two wives now. Um, they start having children. And um, so then the, uh, uh, at the end of that seven years, he doesn't have, he doesn't really have anything to take care of. He's kind of living off his, his father-in-law, who's also his uncle. Um, it's interesting times. And so he, um, he works for him for another seven years, uh, getting wages of, of animals, flocks, right? And now he's kind of, over that seven years, God is prospering. He's got quite a bit, but he's just feeling like Laban's never going to let him go. And so he decides to run away while Laban is away and, you know, take his, pick up his family and head back to the land of Canaan to where his family is and make it back there before, you know, Laban can stop him. That's where we pick up this story. So in verse 22, when Laban was informed on the third day that Jacob had fled, he took his kinsmen with him and pursued him a distance of seven days journey. Now you have to understand Laban is uh, more powerful than Jacob. He's got more men than, than Jacob. He's basically got a little army and he chases after, um, after them. Verse 24. He find, you know, overtook him in the hill country of Gilead, right? So he, he catches up to him before Jacob gets all the way home. Verse 24, however, God came to Laban, the Aramean, in a dream of the night. And this is the night before he's going to meet with Jacob and said to him, be careful that you do not speak to Jacob, either good or bad. This is our phrase again. This is the good or evil, Right. Be careful that you do not speak to Jacob, either good or bad. Now, you should stop on that for a second and say, hey, now, wait a minute. I get it why God would not want Laban to say something bad to Jacob, but why would God not want him to say something good to Jacob? And if you're taking those terms literally and not as an idiomatic phrase, then it doesn't really make sense. Of course, God would want Laban to say something good to him, to bless him, that only makes sense. But once we understand, no, this, this phrase is idiomatic and it doesn't mean good or bad, right? It means judgment. So that's what he's saying here. Be careful that you do not speak to Jacob, either good or bad. You are not allowed to have judgment over Jacob. Laban wants to have, have judgment over Jacob. We're going to see this in a second. Verse 25, and Laban caught up with Jacob. Uh, now Jacob had pitched his tent in the hill country and Laban with his kinsmen camped in the hill country of Gilead. Then Laban said to Jacob, what have you done by deceiving me and carrying uh, away my daughters like captives of the sword? Why did you flee secretly and deceive me and did not tell me so that I may, might have sent you away with joy and with songs, with tambourine and with lyre, which is almost certainly not. He would not have done. He's lying about that. And did not allow me to kiss my grandchildren and my daughters. Now you have done foolishly. Verse 29. It is in my power to do you harm. Right? So this is what Laban was really intending. He was going to come past judgment on uh, Jacob for doing all these bad things and do him harm, maybe kill him and take his daughters and his grandchildren back to Aram, uh, maybe put him in shackles and bring him back up there. You know, who, who knows what he exactly means by this, but whatever it was, he, he's, he was going to do this. But the God of your father spoke to me now last night saying, be careful not to speak either good or bad to Jacob. In other words, you are not allowed to judge him. You don't have that authority. Verse 30. Now you have indeed gone away because you longed greatly for your father's house. But why did you steal my gods? 
Then Jacob replied to Laban, because I was afraid, for I thought that you would take your daughters from me by force. The one with whom you find your gods shall not live. All right, so somebody stole it. It's Rachel who stole this. In the presence of our relatives, point out what is yours among my belongings and take it for yourself. Now, Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them. So Laban went into Jacob's tent and into Leah's tent and into the tent of the two slave women, but he did not find them. He's looking for, you know, he's mad, right? He's mad. He's coming in with anything he can. He stole something from him, right? And he didn't steal family. He didn't steal flocks. He wanted to accuse him of that, but he definitely stole these household idols. Then he went out of Leah's tent and entered Rachel's tent. Now, Rachel had taken the household idols and put them in the camel saddlebag, and she sat on them. So Laban searched through all the tent, but did not find them. And she said to her father, may my Lord not be angry that I cannot stand in your presence because the way of women is upon me. So he searched, but he did not find the household idols. Then Jacob became angry and argued with Laban. And Jacob said to Laban, what is my offense? What is my sin that you have hotly pursued me? Remember this judgment. Is he want, he's going to punish him for the sin that he's committed against Laban. Though you have searched through all my property, what have you found of all your household property? Set it here in front of my relatives and your relatives so that they may decide between the two of us. For these 20 years, I have been with you. Your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried, nor have I eaten the rams of your flocks. I did not even bring to you that which was torn by wild animals. I took the loss myself. You demanded it of my hand, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. This is how I was by the day. By, uh, by day, the heat consumed me and the frost by night and my sleep fled from my eyes. For these 20 years, I have been in your house. I served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flock. And you changed my wages 10 times. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham and the fear of Isaac had not been for me, surely now you would have sent me away empty handed. God has seen my affliction and labor of my hands. So he rendered judgment last night, right? So in other words, Laban wanted to render judgment and it was find some reason of offense, sin again, that Jacob had committed against Laban and punish him for it and use that as an excuse to take his daughters and his grandchildren and probably the flocks and servants as well and take them back up to a to Aram. But we see here that God has said to, to Laban, you are not allowed to render judgment in this case. And here we see that Jacob says it's God who has rendered judgment in this case. So here's what the idiom means. The idiom means to have the right, this is the, the idiom of the knowledge of good and evil, the right to make a judgment of what is right and wrong, right? To have the authority to make judgment of what is right and what is wrong. And I want to show you a very clear example where the, the whole phrase knowledge of good and evil is used, where you can, you can definitely see this occurring. This is Deuteronomy chapter one. Uh, we're going to read verses 19 through 39. And this is where what has happened is the, um, uh, the Israelites, you know, they went to Mount Sinai and made the covenant and then uh, built the tabernacle and God took them up to the border uh, to enter into the promised land, the land of Canaan that he was going to give them. And um, they came, you know, came up with the idea to send in 12 spies first and kind of get the lay of the land. And Moses thought that was a good idea. So he's, you know, he sent, he sent them in, they came back with a, um, a report, 10 of the spies had a bad report that said, you know, this is terrible. These guys are giants. They're, um, they're going to kill us. They've got big walled cities. We'll never survive this. God has brought us here to kill us. We need to flee back to Egypt. Two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb, they brought back a good report that said, no, 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 you know, we need to have faith in God. He's look at how, what all he's done for us. It, you know, he's definitely going to, to give us favor and drive out our enemies and go before us. And we're ac absolutely going to, to win this fight. And, uh, but the people of Israel, 
um, and you should know this, and it'll this helps in some of what we're we're about to read, is that the men twenty years and older of the society rendered judgment, and what they did was they decided they're going to go with the bad report, and they want to kill Moses, right, and. And so God intervenes in that situation. He pronounces the 40-year curse on them. They're going to wander in the desert. Every, um, every male 20 and older, except these few exceptions, are going to die in the desert. If they were under 20 at that time, then they with the children would grow up and then they would enter into that promised land. So skip ahead 40 years. We're now at the point where they're, all those people have died and they're ready to go into the promised land. And in Deuteronomy chapter one, Moses is reminding the people of all these things. And we get into this one section um, here in uh, Deuteronomy 119, where he's going to be covering some of what I just talked about. And we're going to see a usage of this phrase that helps us to understand really what this phrase means. Deuteronomy 1, 19 through 39. Then we set out from Horeb. Remember, this is Moses recant, uh, recounting to the people before they're going to go into the, the promised land after the 40 years. And went through all that great and terrible wilderness that you saw on the way to the hill country of the Amorites, just as the Lord our God had commanded us. And we came to Kadesh Barnea. And I said to you, you have come to the hill country of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is about to give us. See the Lord your God has placed the land before you. Go up, take possession, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has spoken to you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Then all of you approached me and said, let us send men ahead of us so that they may spy out the land for us and bring us, bring back to us word of the way by which we should go up and the cities which we should enter. The plan pleased me, and I took 12 of your men, one man for each tribe. Then they turned and went up into the hill country and came to the valley of Eskel and spied it out. And they took some of the fruit of the land in their hands and brought it down to us. They also brought us back a report and said, the land of the Lord our God is about to give us is good. Yet you were unwilling to go up. Instead, you rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. And you grumbled in your tents and said, because the Lord hates us, he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to hand us over to the Amorites to destroy us. Where can we go up? Our brothers have made our hearts melt by saying the people are bigger and taller than we. The cities are large and fortified up to heaven. And besides, we saw the sons of the Anakim there. These are giant guys. But I said to you, do not be terrified nor fear them. The Lord, your God, who goes before you will himself fight for you, just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes and in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord, your God, carried you just as a man carries his son on all of the road which you have walked until you came to this place. Yet, in spite of all this, you did not trust the Lord, your God, who goes before you on your way to seek out a place for you to make camp in the fire by night to show you the way by which you should go and in the cloud by day. Then the Lord heard the sound of your words and he was angry and swore an oath saying, not one of these men, this evil generation shall see the good land, which I swore to give your fathers, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he shall see it. And to him, I will give the land in which he has set his foot into his son because he has followed the Lord fully. The Lord was angry with me also on your account, saying, not even you shall, Moses shall enter there. Joshua, the son of Nun, who stands before you, shall in himself enter there. Encourage him, for he will give it to Israel as an inheritance. Moreover, your little ones, who you said would become plunder, and your sons, who this day have no knowledge of good and evil, talking about this day um, at at, at that time, who this day have no knowledge of good and evil, shall enter there, and I will give it to them, and they shall take possession of it. So he's recalling again, back when God said all this 40 years earlier, that their sons, who were under the age of 20, um, they had no knowledge of good and evil, so God is exempting them and from the, the curse and they're going to get to enter. Okay, well, you know, what's going on here? Well, we see 
you know, we've, we've already seen this, this idea of, you know, good and evil being a, um, an idiomatic phrase for the, the right and authority to judge and determine. And so here's the deal. In, um, in their culture, you, when, when you turn 20 years old, you were then a man, you were, you were eligible to go to war. You were eligible to have been a person to have gone into the promised land. You had a vote, right? In this set, you had a say in this and all of the people with a few exceptions, um, all, all of these men with a few exceptions who were 20 and older, um, they didn't want to go. They didn't want to go back, right? But if you were 19 at the time, you didn't have that authority. You certainly knew what the difference between good and evil was, right? 19-year-olds obviously know what good is and obviously know what evil is. A nine-year-old knows that, right? It's not what it's talking about. It's an idiom that means they didn't have the authority to make a decision in this case, a judgment about whether they should go in or run away to Egypt. And because they didn't have that authority, God is going to exempt them and allow them in later. So since they didn't have a say, they couldn't say, well, I don't agree with you guys. I think I should go in. They're exempt. They don't have the knowledge of good and evil. They don't have that authority. So only the ones 20 and older are, are cursed. So we can see this phrase, the knowledge of good and evil. So let's do a quick review and uh, we'll close out part two and then we'll pick up in part three, going back to Genesis three. So we saw that the phrase good and evil relates to the idea of judging and judgment. And we saw that the idiom, the knowledge of good and evil means to have the right to make a judgment of what is right and what is wrong. What should you do? What, you sh what should you not do? That you have the authority and the right to make that judgment. So we'll pick it up in part three, where we're going to take this. Now that we know what the idiom means, we're going to take that back into Genesis 2 and 3 and be able to understand what is going on.